Right, our second paper is going to be delivered by Catherine Meininger and Tyler Pruitt. Uh, Delta EITP is now ITU 2124. Is the industry ready to move on from Delta E2000? Uh, Catherine is a color scientist for portrait displays in Edmonds, Washington. And in 2018, she received her BS in motion picture science from RIT. It's a good place to go to school. Uh, she's also very uh, active in SEMTI. While she was a senior at RIT, she was president of the student chapter there, also a Wolf Scholarship recipient, and last year uh, was an honorable mention in the Student Paper Award for her senior research at RIT. Uh, Tyler, we are going to buy him an RIT hockey jersey just so you can fit in, it's okay. Um, Tyler works for uh, Portrait also out of Edmonds, Washington. And Tyler's role is technical evangelist for the company's CalMan display calibration software. For his company's HDR efforts, he was deeply involved in the development of calibration processes, CalMan workflows, and measurement methodologies for Dolby Vision, HDR10, and HLG. So welcome Catherine and Tyler. Thanks, David. So, um, the introduction to our paper is color is really one of the most powerful tools in modern filmmaking, but tied to that is color accurate monitoring. It is absolutely necessary for these advanced color workflows and pipelines. So when we're dealing with color accuracy, we're dealing with calibration and also validation of um, display accuracy. So now we're gonna talk about color difference metrics, because that is what is mostly used to evaluate the accuracy and um, whether a display is acceptable for mastering content. So looking at these two charts, this is the same data set, same exact measurements shown in Delta E2000 and Delta ITP. And we can see it, we're not even using the same Y axis because the ITP is much larger, it goes all the way up to 16. So we're gonna go into why this is and what people in the industry should be aware of when they're using this new metric, Delta E ITP. So let's step back and Jacqueline and everybody did a great job kind of talking about Delta E, but really it's uh, a distance between two points in a known color space with some th also things added uh, in Delta E 2094 to, to fix some problems with C-Lab, but you also need to understand what underlying color space the Delta E formula is using and what is the intended application for that error formula. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Catherine and she's gonna talk about some interesting stuff. So if we're talking about a delta E value needing to represent a perceptual color difference, it makes sense that the color space that it lies on also has some reference to color perception. So in order to make that happen, we would typically want to design this perceptual color space based on the biological properties of the human visual system. So there's a couple characteristics that could be considered, and they're fairly common in these um, different spaces. So for instance, a, co a perceptual color space may have some relationship to color opponency theory. So when light enters our eyeballs and is focused on the back of our retina, our cones in our phobia are responsible for creating our sensation of vision. Those cones are sensitive to different ranges of wavelengths, either short, medium, or long. And then after those cone responses produce a signal, that signal is then converged into three opponency channels, a red versus green, blue versus yellow, and light versus dark. And this is the color information that our brain uses to do all the rest of our color processing. A perceptual color space may also want to account for the nonlinear response that humans have to physical stimuli, as stated in Stephen's Power Law. And what that nonlinear response is varies depending on what uh, physical stimuli you've been exposed to. So we typically, um, a common uh, relationship, for example, our perception of brightness, can sometimes be summed down to about a cube root uh, function. And Arguably, most importantly, a uh, perceptual color space should also be able to take into account the variations in the human visual system as it changes with respect to our environmental conditions. So for instance, something like chromatic adaptation should be accounted for. Um, so whenever you have, uh, whenever 
we're in a different environmental condition, the output of our cone responses will change depending on what they've been exposed to and for how long. So in a mathematical sense, we try to attribute that by applying a gain factor to a uh, LMS cone response, and that type of transformation we refer to as a von Kriesch transform. So both C-Lab and ICTCP both basically try to accomplish the same thing. We want to create a perceptual uniform color space um, and represent how the human visual system processes color. So both color spaces have representations of color opponency and their axes of red, green, blue, yellow, and light and dark. They both contain nonlinear transfer functions and they both try to account for chromatic adaptation. But how these spaces implement this process is significantly different and it impacts how we make that estimation of a perceived color difference. So in the case of C-Lab, it uses a cube root function, much like what we just explained a couple slides ago in the Stevens power law, though it does apply a gain and offset factor, so it makes it not quite a cube root function anymore. Um, and then when we want to account for chromatic adaptation, we do a normalization to XYZ tristimulus values to a given reference white. And if you've been paying attention, this is arguably not what we just talked about actually happens in the biological system, where we actually have an adjustment of LMS cone responses instead. And so this aspect of C-Lab actually can cause some uh, problems when we do our color modeling. So whenever a gain transformation is applied to um, a value that is not a LMS cone response or a cone fundamental, um, we call this a wrong von Kriesch transform. And what happens is we actually get, start getting incorrect predictions of chromatic adaptation under different illuminant conditions. So the diagram that you see here is a representation of a corresponding color set. So you have a same set of colors in how they're presented or how they're viewed in one illuminant condition compared to another illuminant condition. So the open circles represent a color under their first illuminant condition, and the open triangles represent the colors under the second. The arrows pointing to the filled triangles are representations of how C-Lab would predict how that chromatic adaptation should occur for that particular color. And you'll notice how far apart some of these triangles are to one another. Um, this is that impact of doing this normalization on an XYZ trisimulus value rather than an LMS cone response. So actually if you had gone back and done a transform of XYZ to LMS first and then done your uh, gain adjustment, you would find that the chromatic adaptation prediction um, becomes much more improved. So this is part of the reason, among some other ones that we don't have time to get into today, of why C-Lab had to create um, modifications to their color difference formula. So the original color difference formula was just a Euclidean distance in the C-Lab color space, um, and then some modifications to account for these differences were changed in the color difference formula, not trying to correct the color space that has these inherent flaws, so that way people who had been collecting data in the C-Lab color space won't have their data invalidated by, this, by these um, adjustments. So Delta 94 added weighting functions to lightness, chroma, and hue, and parametric factors to account for variations in viewing conditions. These still weren't enough to correct all the differences and deviations in the color space, so they created Delta E2000 and added a lot more mathematical functions to that. So there's an interactive hue and chroma term. The A star axis, the one that's responsible for red-green color difference, um, was adjusted to improve performance for low chroma colors. And a hue-dependent function was added to account for some perceived hue differences. So in addition to all of these changes, it's important to remember that Del T2000 is defined with some disclaimers. For instance, specific reference conditions. Um, most importantly to note, for instance, is your illumination in your environment should be related to D65. Um, the approximate surround illuminance should be about 1,000 lux. And whatever object it is that you're actually going under test should be in a uniform neutral gray background field, something similar to what you associate with a light box. And so when viewing conditions deviate from these defined conditions, your parametric factors should be used. And those factors would then have to be experimentally derived and experimentally validated to make sure that your color differences are accurate. Um, so you can imagine that requires some time and effort to make that happen. So the CIA did recommend um, that these parametric factors should be defined relative to a specific set of viewing conditions that pertain to a given application or industry. And as far as we're aware, um, these parametric factors have not been defined for the evaluation of displays, nor have they been commonly used in any of these color difference calculations. Speaking of displays, there's an additional disclaimer that's important to recognize, and that's that DE2000 was defined to only be used for reflective media and transmitting objects. 
and it would only apply to displays if the display was being used to simulate those types of objects. And so if a display is simulating, uh, or it appears to be something that's emitting light or is a spectral reflection of light, this standard is not supposed to apply, and you can't use Del T2000 to accurately predict color difference formulas. So we're gonna touch on this a little bit more in a couple more slides, but right now we're gonna take a quick turn and talk a little bit about ICTCP, and it has a little bit of a shorter story than uh, C-Lab does. So ICTCP uses the perceptual quantizer, or PQ curve, to model the human visual system nonlinear response. The difference for the PQ curve versus other power function nonlinearities that are commonly used in color spaces is that it takes into account changes in the human visual system um, and contrast sensitivity with respect to overall luminance levels. So the PQ curve tracks whatever that sensitivity is as it even changes over uh, spatial frequency and it picks whatever the maximum sensitivity is for each luminance level. That way, you're not running the risk of under-predicting a perceived difference, um, but you may run the risk of over-predicting depending on what stimuli you're referencing. In addition, ICTCP also does apply a proper transform to LMS cone responses to model its chromatic adaptation, so we don't have the similar issues of um, chromatic adaptation modeling that we do in C-Lab. The color difference formula of delta EITP is also has its basis in a Euclidean distance formula, but there are some small modifications. For instance, there's a 0.25 scalar on the CT axis. This is because ICTCP is not only a perceptual color space, but it was also meant to be an encoding replacement for YCBCR. So some adjustments were made to the color space in order to make it compatible with doing that type of swap out. Um, so values were expanded to fill up the entire range of like BT2020 gamut, skin tone, or there's a rotation in there to make skin tones aligned. Um, and they wanted to make sure that you can fill that full excursion in the color difference channels when you're transmitting your signal. So, in order to get back and have a color difference formula, we need to undo that intentional scaling and get back to our original threshold space. There's a 720 global scalar on the entire formula, and this was derived from a best fit of HDR and wide color gamut just noticeable difference data set um, that's been presented here at SMPTE conference last year, and Quick Shoutout is an award recipient at this year's conference as well. Um, so basically how this scalar was derived was they found what the average value of this metric was without the scalar um, across all the data sets. So the data sets included luminance values um, and colors that were both in very low luminance ranges, very high luminance ranges, and also including the SDR um, typical ranges. So throughout that entire data set, they found that the average value that fit a JND was about one over 720. So if you throw a 720 scalar on the whole metric, you approximately get a value of one is equivalent to a JND. So this poses an interesting conundrum between these two metrics because there's a different numerical representation for what a JND would represent. So for delta E2000, it's relatively commonly accepted that a value of two to three can get you close to a JND. But this value is inconsistent throughout the color space. In some places it's 0.5, maybe it's one, maybe it's two. So it's led to some confusion a little bit on how you can actually draw a conclusion of how close or how perceivable a color difference may be. This is a little bit easier in delta ITP that we actually have a defined value of one being a JND, um, and this is more consistent throughout a color space. So using this information, if both metrics were accurately predicting perceptual color differences in JNDs, we would expect to see smaller delta EITP values than DE2000. But in our research, we found that this is actually rarely the case, and delta EITP is almost always larger than delta E2000. And since we have previous JND studies that have shown that delta EITP is a more consistent predictor of JNDs than delta E2000, you wonder with the conclusion then, so does that mean that delta E2000 has been significantly under predicting color differences? So this is really the focus of why we wanted to do this research and really explore the differences between these two metrics and develop some sort of relationship to, okay, how do we interpret perceptual differences from these numerical values? Um, and so before we start getting into measured data and how it actually applies to display calibration, we wanted to break it down and do some theoretical comparisons first. That way we can isolate how the metrics perform to luminance deviations and how they would perform with chromatic deviations. 
So these diagrams are showing first our example of doing luminance deviations. We did a plus or minus 10% luminance suite around a D65 white point or in different situations. So in the diagram on the left is the DE2000 results. And what this is is a 10% luminance sweep around a 100 nit D65 white. And what we did here was since the C-Lab calculation um, depends on a reference white specification, we provided what would happen if you had a display with varying max uh, white capabilities. Since when we're also calculating delta T2000, it's been pretty common to pick the peak white of the display to be that reference white. Um, so what you see here is we've picked a 100 nit reference white, so the same as our target, a 1000 nit reference, and a 10,000 nit reference. And you can see in the diagram that as we increase what that reference white is, we get a corresponding decrease in what Del T2000 predicts to be that perceptual difference, even though technically nothing has changed with this stimuli. Um, and you can contrast this then with the DEITP model on the other side where in this case, since delta, I, delta EITP doesn't require specification of a reference white, we went ahead and just looked at what the luminance differences would be at 100 nits, at 1,000 nits, and at 10,000 nits. And we can see that we're not seeing a, a tremendous difference necessarily between these three. Um, and so that's the, one of the beauties of the PQ curve is that there is no relative reference to how these luminances would be in respect to each other. You just take it as what the stimuli is and then you see what would happen around things that are near it. So let's talk for a moment about this impact of a reference white um, on, on the C-Lab calculation in a Del T2000. So the CIE recommends that your reference white be picked as something that is a perfectly reflecting diffuser within your scene. So that's implying that there must be some illumination source and there must be some white within your scene that your eye is picking as your reference white and is doing your chromatic adaptation to. So that means all the colors that are also in the scene are made up of some fractional amount of what's coming off of that white reference in your scene. So what happens though when you have a scene that doesn't have a reference white? What is your eye picking for that value? So if we're choosing the maximum white of the display to be our reference white, we're basically saying that our eye is always adapted to this super high luminance when in fact it may not be and we may be somewhere else uh, in our terms of adaptation, color, color appearances may be more obvious than what DE2000 would really suggest. Um, and this aspect of C-Lab is actually predictable if you just take a look at the mathematics. So this is the C-Lab lightless function, and we're gonna continue on with our 100 nit white reference. And let's say that that's what we wanted our target to be, but we actually measured 90 nits instead. Okay, so what would be that perceived color difference? So if we take our reference white to be at the same as our target, you see we have this large difference between them. So it's about an L star difference of about a value of five. So now if we ump bump that up and we say we want a thousand nit reference, look at how much lower down our values got and how much closer together they are. Now we're in a difference of about two. And then if we raise that up again to 10,000, we're even closer and now we have a variation of a a less than a value of one between our two stimuli. So again, in the viewing situation, nothing has changed here, but because of this compression in the, light, in the lightness function and this definition of a reference white, we're saying that everything is down lower and you can't see these differences as well. So imagine you know, when you're outside in a really bright place and you're trying to look at things that are dark, it's hard for you to differentiate details in those dark areas. That's what C-Lab is representing here, kind of. So ICTCP does not have this impact because it doesn't have any sort of reference white to modify its values to. The use of PQ is providing a consistent mapping of luminance, so regardless of what your display capabilities are, or regardless of decisions that you're making, your color difference formula is going to be accurate to the stimuli that you're testing. So you can see then, you know, if we want to try to avoid this artifact, or not necessarily artifact, but this effect of this compression in the L-star curve, you could take your reference white to be at the same luminance level, that was whatever target you have under test. But another caveat of that, is then that means you're not really seeing any differences in those stimuli when they're were great at that level. So the diagram on the left shows here, we have now are looking at our 10% luminance sweep for a 100 nit, 1000 nit, and 10,000 nit white point, and we've varied the reference white luminance to match that. And it shows that there's relative, no difference between those different luminance levels and how you would perceive those differences for the same amount of luminance deviation. Again, that's the benefit in Delta ITP that, that they have is that there is that consideration of those little bit of shape changes in our luminance perception when we get adapted to those higher luminance levels.
So in general, you can say that there's a philosophical difference in how C-Lab and ICTCP treat the adaptation of the human visual system. C-Lab does something more like a global adaptation to a reference white, while ICTCP has an adaptation to a color under test. So if you're in a situation where you're evaluating color and you have a scene that has um, it looks like it has a reference white in it, then you could probably use C-Lab like how we usually have been and take that max white and the color differences will probably or may match what its behavior is when we do that. But if you have a situation where you don't have a reference white and you don't necessarily know what your eye is picking to be your reference white, then it might be a better option to pick your reference white to have the same luminance as your target. So this was something similar that they also did in the JND study, and they found that doing this did improve the JND prediction of delta E2000. So in practice, you should now be able to understand this impact of the reference white, how you should choose it with respect to your situation, and then how you can interpret your delta E2000 values accordingly. So now we're going to move on to talk about chromaticity deviations. So Continuing on, we wanted to investigate an SDR scenario and an HDR scenario. So we continue with our D65 white point, and we did a chromaticity sweep um, around that. So it would be about plus or minus a 0 0.005 total XY chromaticity error. So we did that around a D65 white, around 709 primaries with a 100 nit, D, uh, 100 nit white point. Um, and then that was our SDR case. And then for HDR, we did a 2020 primaries with a 1000 nit white. And um, as you can see on the top, we did a comparison of del T2000, the way that it's commonly calculated, um, when it's calculated with the target luminance, um, and of course with del EITP. And we wanted to create a relationship of these del E numerical values to how would we interpret a visual difference from them. Um, so to do that, we assumed that del E will scale linearly with J and Ds. So if we have a value of two to three for del T2000, go up to the next level, three to four, four to five, so on and so forth. And so what we found was that for nearly every scenario, Delta 2000 predicts differences within one J and D. So there's a couple places like in the uh, uh, HDR red scenario where we got a little bit above that, but still for the most part, if you saw these results, you would think, yeah, I'm doing a pretty good job. So contrast this with delta EITP, which never suggests that differences are within one J and D. Um, the lowest we actually get is a more close approximation to a value of two. Um, so these are quite different results that you would interpret, again, for the same amount of chromatic deviation. In addition, we also find that delta EITP increases with more saturated colors. So that means you have a less wiggle room and less room for error as you go to wider gamuts because the metric will say, hey, these deviations can be seen more here. So it may be more difficult to hit a low delta EITP value at these areas, especially when you're trying to calibrate them. And also of, important to, of importance to point out is huge discrepancies in the blue region. So for delta E2000, again, we're saying everything's about in one J and D, but delta EITP, we suggest values of six to seven or 12. So if you're trying to make a, or a, a determination of how accurate a display is, one saying, yeah, you're really good, and the other saying, no, you're really bad. So this poses an interesting conundrum and something that we have to figure out how to really adjust to. And so we can look at this blue region more, um, and specifically we'll use the 709 demonstration. So to point out where some of these differences are coming from, what this diagram is, is it's showing the differences in tolerance and sensitivity um, for, the, for these metrics. So delta E2000 is on the left, DEITP is on the right, and I want you to really pay attention to the blue region here. So note, um, so green arrows specify tolerance, meaning smaller delta E values, and red arrows represent sensitivity, so higher delta E values. And so delta E2000 would suggest that you would have less visual differences as we move towards white and red, but DEITP says the exact opposite and says that we would have bigger perceptual differences. So if you're designing, say, a gamut mapping algorithm, which metric do you adhere to? Which one is right? How do you balance the values if you have to read a, reach a specification that satisfies both color metrics? And we can look a little bit closer here to, again, kind of examine these magnitude and sensitivity differences. So this is our chromaticity sweeps for DE2000, and the color bars representing the magnitude of the delta E2000 metric. Um, and then you can kind of interpret on the 2D diagram better uh, the shape as well on how this, how the delta E metric um, varies with respect to uh, 
um, these chromaticity deviations. So you can see here that we have relatively, this is about the, the sensitivity direction here, so delta E2000 is more sensitive to equal changes in XY chromaticity, so it's the same sign direction. Um, and if we compare that to delta E ITP, you know, the red here should be firing off alarm bells, at least it does for me. We're getting much different responses here, and, you know, to stay within 1J and D, we have a much smaller tolerance, um, in the, as indicated by this green circle. So very quickly, we can go from saying, yeah, we're, we're within a J and D to no, we're not, um, and the, how that is decided, you know, that direction is different as well. Um, so DEITP is, more sen is less sensitive to changes in Y chromaticity and would be more changes in sensitivity to your X chromaticity. And so this is just one case um, that we really want to highlight. Most of the other differences between the two metrics can be chalked up to just magnitude differences, but this blue region in particular was the one that was very interesting to take a look at, so that's why we wanted to spend the time here. Um, so now we're gonna move on into talking about our calibration examples, and I'm gonna hand it back off to Tyler. Thanks. So we wanted to take some real world data and apply these two metrics. So we had an SDR scenario and an HDR scenario. The um, SDR scenario was an OLED-based display that was calibrated 2.4 gamma D65709, and then the HDR scenario was an LCD-based uh, HDR reference monitor that was calibrated to PQ uh, 2020. It really uh, covered a, pretty much 100% of P3 inside of 2020, but obviously it wasn't a full 2020 display. So our threshold for pass-fail was a DE of three or less. Um, and we didn't measure the grayscale, we didn't use all the code values measuring the grayscale of the HDR monitor all the way to 10,000 nit code value. We just stopped at the 1,000 nit code value. So now we're gonna look at our SDR results. Now one thing I wanted to keep reiterating is this reference white D65 at target Y is a theoretical modification to Delta E2000 that I'm unaware of any software besides somebody's Excel spreadsheet that actually is using that. Um, people might be open to adding it. We might even add it to CalMan. But even with that adaption or that adjustment to Delta E2000, it does not perform as well as Delta ITP. So for example, the regular Delta E2000, this SDR data set, and the data set we used was the Macbeth color checker and a set of grayscale steps. But we had zero uh, patches that read over a Delta E of three in that data set. When we used the, um, the theoretical Delta E2000 modification, we were up to 9%, and then Delta E ITP, it was 4.87%. Um, Really, we see most of the changes at lone luminance um, in, in this data sets, and we actually decided to not go below 0.1 nit, even though we could measure below that. So if we chart those all three together, this is what we'll see. So we have our threshold is the blue horizontal line, and the delta E2000 uh, regular is pretty much all close to or under two. Um, but then when we switch to ITP, we have some values that are up in the six and seven range. So uh, it's very important to know what to expect with those because one thing that we really focused on with this paper is we didn't want to just have people start using Delta ITP and then all of a sudden freak out and think their previously calibrated monitor was complete garbage or something like that. Um, we didn't want, we, we think there needs to be a transition period where people are looking at both and just understanding the limits of what Delta E2000 can tell you. So now for HDR results. This is where we saw a, 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 lot, a lot larger errors. Um, Delta E2000 pretty much, we also didn't see any values over three, our threshold, um, but the ITP ones, it was close to 50% of the patches were um, over three. One thing to keep in mind is we did not push, the, the patch set 
every patch was within 90% of P3, so we weren't even using all of P3. So we weren't going out to measuring colors that the display could not do. We were actually inside of the, completely inside of the display's capabilities. So now we've looking at the same chart for HDR, and we can see we have values up to 14. Um, and the patch set we used for the color evaluation of the HDR monitor was actually one based on actual HDR content where uh, we worked with a streaming provider that had a piece of content that they used to evaluate displays and we got the RGB values from that in real content and it wasn't just some uh, color checker chart that was designed for really for cameras. So we really, want to focus on letting you guys know that these are real HDR colors that are actually used in HDR content. So this is my favorite chart of the whole presentation that um, Catherine came up with. So we wanted to kind of be able to visualize where these errors were coming from. Was it coming from the chromaticity error or the luminance related error? So to explain this chart, um, the color of the dot is its delta E value. The size of it is its actual like Euclidean distance or percentage of luminance difference. So if you have a color that, if you have a red color that's a big dot, that means there was a very large deviation to make that large error. If you have a little tiny red dot, that means there was a very small deviation in, in the XY values or the luminance to actually show a, a really high delta E value. So Catherine's gonna give our conclusions. I would talk really fast, but I only have a couple seconds to do that. So I'll give you guys this full, ver uh, full value here. Fortunately, we're at the end of the day, so I hope I don't mind if I go a little bit over here. Um, so our conclusions basically in SDR scenarios, we discovered that there's going to be slight increases in your error magnitude for Delta ITP, but not significant enough where you might have like a, a shock value of seeing these uh, different numerical representations. Um, in HDR scenarios, though, the common usage of Delta E2000 combined with the improper modeling that we've demonstrated here today has led to significant underpredictions of visual differences for our HDR and wide color gamut stimuli. Um, so Delta E ITP is going to estimate larger perceived differences as saturation increases also. So this means that there's less room for error in your wide gamut colors. So that poses an interesting engineering problem where you're not going to have to be as uh, specific in your calibration for maybe an SDR gamut, but when you expand out to 2020, you have to be a lot more precise to fit that same, if you're trying to meet the same uh, error value um, for, for your whatever your pass-fail metric is. And in general, most color regions are gonna simply see a magnitude difference, um, but blue regions in particular, as we show, um, are, are sensitive to the direction uh, of deviations. And so as an industry, we need to reset our expectations when it comes to interpreting these J and D values from, these J and Ds from delta E values. We've been accustomed to seeing a value of two to three to indicate a J and D, um, but delta E ITP uses a value of one. And so even if you see similar numerical values, you have to remember that delta E ITP is still suggesting a larger perceptual difference. So you have to take that into account when you're trying to understand the accuracy of your display. And as Tyler said before, since there are significant differences between these two metrics, we suggest that they be reported together to help people transition and know kind of, okay, this is what I've been used to seeing, here's what I'm going to start seeing um, in this new metric here. And for future work, um, there needs to be more J&D studies to continue to expand the data available to test and optimize color difference metrics. They can only be as accurate as the data that's available to optimize to. Um, and this behavior around blue and high saturation is of particular interest. For instance, do the color difference metrics that we have scale, how do they scale with more J&Ds? Does a delta ITP value of three mean three J&Ds? How much wiggle room do we have at the top end um, in respect, you know, is it really 14 J&Ds at those super high saturated levels? And again, how how do we, and then of course, how do we draw conclusions of isolated patch viewing situations to real content viewing situations? We know that the human visual system responds differently to actual content, texture, size, spatial frequency. So how can we make our calibrations give accurate reports that represent what they would be seeing when they're actually watching content on their calibrated displays? And I don't know if you'll have time to come to the mic to have questions, but thank you for attending and staying. All right, any questions? All right, as Jim comes up, I have one question. Tyler, you have the coolest shoes at Simpty. Where did you get them? 
Hi, Jim Houston. Um, I just have one question, a, a little bit along the lines of your conclusions about evaluating the JNDs in blue for particular. Uh, yes, the, uh, the Delta E for IPT has more sensitivity, so you get more numbers out of it. But is there confirmation at the ground truth level that someone can see a high chroma, low luminance difference in blue to match the numerical values that uh, IPT suggests, because when you showed that diagram with the uh, center blue having the, the greens and the other red around the outside, that's counterintuitive to experience that you might have with actual displays in where it's actually really hard to see code value differences between blues, even with some of the current uh, metrics. So I, I sort of wanted to see the comparison or understand, do you have that confirmation of the value versus the perception that a person can actually see that difference. Yeah, so I would recommend that you check out the JND study that was done. Um, it was published in a SIMTI journal and was uh, in conference proceedings from last year. They investigated, um, I think, luminance levels that were in, I think, like the 0.1 nit range and included a blue there. Um, but we need more data to really understand that perception of around. So if, if we deviate in XY chromaticity or in luminance, we don't have data right now to validate, for instance, you know, if, if we, like you were saying, when we expand out from that green region and the values get larger, is that an accurate representation of that? We're not sure yet, and that's why we just need more research. And as we know that, we can make our color difference metrics that more accurate. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'll just make a comment to Jim's point uh, that in practical experience, we feel like we can't see blue as much. Uh, so our earlier talk today, we hinted at a spatiochromatic uh, version of the model. Mm -hmm. And that is important to add for practical imagery because we know uh, due to chromatic aberration in the eye that your, frequency, your spatial frequency bandwidth of blue, yellow is much, much less mm -hmm. and that needs to be taken into account. So I think I'm trying to make the link between Practical, exper practical experience with imagery and, and color patches, which yeah. is all we're at right now. Yeah, and I, I just want to make clear that, that we're, what we're trying to examine here is trying to demonstrate how these difference metrics are going to be seen and, and how people could be responding to them. Because there's users of the metrics who may not know some of these uh, specifications here. But, you know, if there's someone out there who really only cares, hey, I, you know, I hear that there's this color difference metric and it's supposed to be a value under three, get it to a value under three. Well, even if maybe there's not that perceptual difference, but the metric is saying we're at a value of five or six, we need to find a way to, to balance those things. And again, yeah, that's why more, more research and especially, yeah, the consideration of spatial, uh, spatial properties and all that it is, needs to be considered so that we can accurately create these characterizations and explain, okay, yeah, is this display really calibrated as it should be? That's gonna make us even better. All right, great.